Barbara Snyder, President of Case Western Reserve, and I am proud to welcome you to this year's very special University Distinguished Lecture. Case Western Reserve began this series in 2005. At that time, organizers explained that the purpose of the Distinguished Lecture is to engage the greater Cleveland community in discussions about important topics of our time. The series began with Steven Pinker, the Harvard cognitive psychologist, and has since included such luminaries as Jared Diamond, author of Collapse, How Societies Choose to Fail or Succeed, and Kay Redfield Jameson, one of the world's foremost authorities on bipolar disorder. In 2009, we welcomed E.O. Wilson, a scholar, scientist, environmentalist, and two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize. Look around you in this hall. This year and every year, the Distinguished Lecture has drawn hundreds of people. We welcome high school students, senior citizens, undergraduates, faculty, and staff. The caliber of our speakers has allowed this series to achieve fully its early aspiration. These lectures have indeed engaged the people of Greater Cleveland and enlightened all who gathered to listen. I open by saying this was a very special lecture. This is the case first because of the great accomplishments and insights of our speaker, Dr. Henry Petrosky. But this year we have a second reason for excitement about this gathering. It begins with an absolutely wonderful surprise. It is my great privilege to announce today that Case Western Reserve has received a gift of $1.25 million to endow this distinguished lecture. The gift comes from the Callahan family and is made in honor of Francis Joseph Callahan, Jr. And yes, you may applaud. That's a great announcement. A bit about Joe Callahan. He is a graduate of the United States Naval Academy, an MIT-trained engineer, and a remarkable leader of the company we know today as Swagelock. Joe Callahan is a man whose entire life evidenced a commitment to excellence, to distinction, and service. We are honored that this university lecture will bear the name of such a respected and re revered individual. Unfortunately, Joe Callahan is not well enough to join us today, but representing his family are Joe's son and daughter, Tim Callahan, I'm proud to say a trustee of Case Western Reserve University, and Connie Richards. Please join me in welcoming Tim and Connie. Thank you, Barbara. On behalf of my family, I'd like to say a few words about my father and why we're so pleased to honor him today. Toward the end of World War II, Dad graduated from the Naval Academy and entered the submarine service. While still in the Navy, Dad uh, earned two degrees, two engineering degrees from MIT, but more important, he learned lessons that became lifelong values. Those lessons were, one, find the best people, two, give them everything they need to succeed, and three, treat everyone with respect. Dad brought those values with him when he joined Crawford Fitting Company, which we now know as Swagelock. Over his 40 years at Swagelock, Dad amassed 23 patents on his rise to chairman. His technological expertise and management savvy helped Swagelock grow to more than $1 billion in annual sales. Dad's business success was grounded in his belief that everything should be done first class. And to this day, that belief continues unabated in his support of education, healthcare, and the arts. Tonight, my brother, sister, and I celebrate Dad's passion for civic leadership and community service. We believe, and I hope you agree, that naming the distinguished lecture in honor of my father is a fitting way to pay tribute to the legacy of Joe Callahan, a man of high standards dedicated to helping others. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you again, Tim and Connie. We are so delighted by this gift and by your decision to honor your father in this wonderful way. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Dario Gasparini, a faculty member in civil engineering at Case Western Reserve and the 2009 Technical Educator of the Year, recognized by the Cleveland Technical Society's Council. When you review the writings of Professor Gasparini, one fact is clear, he loves bridges. It is fitting that he is going to introduce our speaker today. Professor Gasparini has studied wood and iron truss bridges from the 1800s, examined the tragic collapse of the Ashtabula Bridge in 1876, and considered ways in which 200-year-old stone arches provide critical lessons for modern-day structural engineers. Today, of course, Professor Gasparini's task is not, in fact, to talk about bridges, but to tell all of us about today's distinguished lecture. Please welcome Professor Dario Gasparini. Well, thank you, President Snyder. Uh, good evening, and welcome to our lecture series. It's my great pleasure tonight uh, to introduce our distinguished lecturer, Henry Petrosky, the Alexander S. Vesic Professor of Civil Engineering at, and Professor of History at Duke University. Professor Petrosky has written and authored uh, 15 books, including To Engineer is Human and Design Paradigms. His latest book, uh, published just last month, is called The Essential Engineer, or why science alone will not solve our global problems. He writes a monthly column for American Scientist, the magazine of Sigma Xi. He has effectively and with great affection represented the engineering profession in national media forums, including the Diane Ream Show, Science Friday, and Tech Nation. He is an elected member of the American uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Society, and the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. His honors include the Washington Award from the Western Society of Engineers, the History and Heritage Award from the American Society of Civil Engineers, and the Ralph Coates Rowe Award from the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. He has also been a long time, very effective chair of the History and Heritage Committee of the American Society of Civil Engineers. Last year at this time, on this stage, Edward O. Wilson described for us a natural world that is wondrously diverse. It's adaptive, it is self-healing, it is intelligent, and it is beautiful. In contrast and in comparison, our engineer world is relatively primitive. It is not very intelligent, and it is often not beautiful, and it is often fragile. But just imagine a world without uh, environmental systems and with periodic outbreaks of cholera. Just imagine a world without airplanes or without other transportation systems. Imagine a world without computers, without wireless telecommunications, without any internet. Imagine a world without medical scanners or other medical diagnostic equipment. Imagine a world that uh, has no advanced man-made materials. This kind of world, it's clear that our society depends on the engineered world to function and to uh, and to continue. It is this very human engineered world that has been the uh, Professor Petrosky's lifelong interest. His books focus on how and why engineers design, the qualities of the objects that they design, the meaning of these objects in our human development, and the distinctions between scientific advances, between artistic design, and between engineering design. Engineering design is creative, but it is fundamentally different from artistic design because it is highly constrained. It is constrained by criteria of safety, functionality, cost, environmental concerns, and social and cultural values. Socially or environmentally short-sighted engineering decisions 
really affect our lives, both now and in the future. These are the issues that really concern our speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in extending a warm welcome to our distinguished lecturer, Henry Petrosky. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Dario. It's an especial honor to uh, be giving this lecture on the occasion of the Callahan's announcement. And it's uh, a great pleasure to, to be here. What I want to talk about tonight is, is engineering and civilization in very broad terms. And I want to also talk about the important role that success and failure plays in engineers' efforts to serve civilization, if not, in fact, to be contributors uh, to it in a very big way. The uh, definition of civilization, according to a, a standard dictionary that I consulted, uh, is that it's the stage of human and social development and organization that is considered most advanced. Uh, engineering could not probably uh, participate if there weren't that notion of advancement. That's what engineering is really all about. A sub-definition of civilization is the comfort and convenience of modern life. And I think we heard from Dario's introduction the role that engineers play in that. So engineering and civilization, to me, are coupled. I don't think you could really have uh, one without the other. The Romans knew this implicitly. And much of what we admire from Rome uh, really has to do with engineering. Just to uh, point out their uh, aqueducts, their um, Roman uh, arch bridges, the familiar semicircular arch, their plumbing, their heating, their domes, and so forth. The uh, images of Roman engineering are familiar to uh, most people, if not to everyone. In, in the lower left, we have the Pont du Gard, which uh, still stands after, after 2,000 years, a monument to the creative water supply that was provided in southern uh, France. Then, of course, the Industrial Revolution is uh, virtually synonymous with engineering advancement, or at least technological advancement. A lot of the early advancements in the Industrial Revolution had to actually take place without benefit of science or very sophisticated engineering. The steam engine, for example, was invented uh, without the benefits of what we today know as the science of thermodynamics. In fact, it was the existence of the engineering achievement of the steam engine that led scientists to question, well, how does it really work? What are the principles behind it? And then science follows. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate on that theme uh, tonight, but uh, that's the theme of the new book that Dario mentioned. The uh, very much of the Industrial Revolution's accomplishments are associated also with, with infrastructure. The steam engine, the iron bridge on the upper right, are familiar symbols of the Industrial Revolution. But I'd like to emphasize something that is not maybe as familiar, and that's the lower right, which is basically the Victoria Embankment in London. Uh, London used to be, uh, the Thames through London used to be virtually an open sewer. Uh, it was uh, not only unpleasant environmentally, but it was unhealthy. And much of the, the engineering that was done, especially in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, really advanced the condition of human health in a great, great way. The uh, introduction, the construction of the Victoria Embankment not only gave Londoners and visitors a nice place to walk and enjoy the uh, river without its environmental uh, problems, uh, but it also conceals the very system that took away those environmental problems, and that's an elaborate sewer system that takes the sewage out beyond where the tides can wash it back to the Houses of Parliament. Today, the Thames River is, of course, clean, relatively speaking, and uh, it's uh, welcoming to tourists, and many of them take boats up and down the river, and when we think about boats, we have to think about, about bridges. Uh, Tower Bridge is uh, another symbol of London. But many people, when they think about bridges in London, think about London bridges falling down. Uh, the problems with bridges that we face today 
the infrastructure problems that we feel uh, are so much a part of modern society are really as old as nursery rhymes. And who knows how old they are? Uh, London Bridge is falling down, and, and we all know uh, that child's crime. But recently, the newest bridge in London across the Thames, a pedestrian bridge, which was uh, created with a rather great fanfare, there was a competition announced as the millennium approached, the year 2000, that wouldn't it be nice to have a bridge, a footbridge, from St. Paul's, one of the great tourist attractions on the north side of the river, to one of the newest tourist attractions on the south side, and that was the Tate Modern Art Gallery, a converted powerhouse uh, that, because of its large spaces, was suitable for showing large pieces of, of modern art. Well, many of you may know the story of this bridge, but I'll try to condense it. Uh, the design competition required that the team designing this bridge consists of an architect, an engineer, and an artist. So the team uh, did that, was that, and the, uh, the artist happened to be a sculptor. A great deal of emphasis was placed on the aesthetics of this bridge, how it would look, what it would appear uh, to uh, visitors coming up and down the river, and even passing under the bridge, because obviously the boats have to do, do that. Well, when this bridge was opened in June of 2000, there were a lot of people who wanted to be the first to cross it, or among the first, at least. And uh, when a bunch of them got on the bridge, the bridge began to, uh, let's say, misbehave, or wobble, as the British tend to say. Uh, so this bridge has come to be called uh, the Wobbly Bridge. And what was happening was, uh, engineers know, and just about everybody knows, that when soldiers walk across a bridge, they march up and down in step, and that can be detrimental to a bridge's stability. And some bridges have been known to move up and down with the soldiers' uh, steps. But in this case, something different happened. And it happened differently because this is a different kind of bridge. It's a very low slung bridge, not like a traditional suspension bridge. And as the people walked across this bridge, the bridge began to wobble sideways. And in doing so, uh, the people naturally got in the rhythm. And as they got in the rhythm of the bridge moving sideways, uh, they increased its tendency to move sideways. This is a certain kind of undesirable feedback, as engineers would refer to it. Well, to make a long story short, because I don't want to concentrate only on, on this bridge, after three days it was closed, and the engineers took the brunt of the criticism for why didn't you figure that one out. Well, it was a very unusual bridge from an aesthetic point of view. And uh, as a result, there was uh, virtually no experience in the engineering of such a bridge. Uh, the artistic argument was that the bridge should have clean lines, uh, and it shouldn't have a lot of the diagonal lines that uh, engineers like to put on bridges to make them more stable and stiff. Uh, well, the, the, the bottom line is that uh, those distracting lines that the artists don't like ended up being uh, put on the bridge and uh, retrofitted, and the bridge is now reopened. The problem this indicates is that we, we hear a lot about working in teams. And uh, there are great benefits to be derived from interdisciplinary cooperation. But if one side of the cooperation tries to dominate the other side, such as the aesthetic trying to dominate the structural, uh, we can find ourselves in embarrassing situations like this. Many of you will probably remember the Minneapolis Bridge that collapsed uh, in, uh, it was going across the Mississippi, uh, and in August of 2007, it just suddenly, suddenly collapsed. Uh, it's not only London that has problems with its uh, infrastructure, the United States does too. And uh, this was a wake-up call in uh, many ways, but the interest in this has somewhat died, died down, but I think it's emblematic of you know, what we want to worry about in this country and this is a constant worry about what is the state of our infrastructure, what is the safety of it, and what can be done about it. This is the replacement bridge in uh, Minneapolis. The Interstate 35 West uh, bridge now looks like this. Uh, this is a fairly standard reaction to a failure, a major failure of a piece of infrastructure. The replacement 
structure doesn't look very much like the old one at all. And this is understandable, and it largely has to do with psychology rather than engineering. You don't want to remind the people that are expected to use this structure uh, that it's a replacement for one that uh, collapsed. The American Society of Civil Engineers has been paying attention to the state of our infrastructure for some years now. And uh, periodically, they offer what uh, um, they release what they call report cards on the infrastructure. And this is the latest one. This was uh, from 2009, just last year. And I just call attention to a couple of items. One is that the bridges in this country received a grade of C, which means uh, medi mediocre. Uh, sadly, that was one of the highest grades in the categories that the en uh, American Society of Civil Engineers looked at. Uh, the overall grade for our infrastructure is poor, D. What's perhaps you know, important for public policy is what is the recommendation of the society? Well, of course, it's to fix up the infrastructure, to raise the grade, if you will. But the estimate of the society is that that would take $2.2 trillion over five years. Now, we've been hearing a lot of thinking in terms of trillions of dollars lately, and we all know now that that's a lot of money if we didn't know it before. What will happen in these times of uh, economic uh, pressure and competition for funds is uh, very likely that the infrastructure will not be addressed in any major way anytime soon, which is, I think, unfortunate. Let me now just talk about something in more general terms and then give some specific examples. I want to talk about engineering generally. How does engineering proceed to design a bridge or to design a replacement bridge or to anticipate failure or to prevent it from happening? This is really at the heart of engineering, regardless of what is being talked about, whether it's infrastructure or machinery or even systems of operation. The, uh, idea of success and failure is key. And I call the interrelationship between success and failure a paradox of design. In trying to design anything, success and failure are strange bedfellows. The paradox is stated this way, that successful designs evolve into failures. I don't think that's necessarily obvious, but I talked to some civil engineering students here at Case earlier this afternoon. And the question of successes evolving into failures actually came up. So I was very pleased that the students were attuned to this. On the other hand, it's, a, it's anticipating failure that leads to success. And I want to illustrate these with some really concrete examples and some, uh, how shall we say it, hypothetical situations. Let's consider the Titanic first. The Titanic is a well-known success or failure? Well, it depends on what side of the iceberg you're on. <laughs> Before the Titanic met the iceberg, and after all, remember, that was really a chance encounter. That didn't have to happen. The Titanic did not have to sink. But before it did, the ship was thought to be unsinkable, quote, unquote, unsinkable. Uh, the people that uh, were on the maiden voyage of the Titanic had great confidence that it was a successfully designed ship and that it would successfully sail across the ocean and they would successfully land in New York. So they had a good time on board up to a point. The uh, fact of the matter is that it was the failure of the Titanic that revealed a lot of latent flaws, not only in it specifically, but in ship design more generally at the time. Now, remember what, what happened, of course. The Titanic went down. Uh, a lot of lives were lost. One of the reasons was that there were not enough lifeboats on board to accommodate all the people that were on board. Now, this seems like a no-brainer uh, today, but at the time, it was just the way things were done. To calculate how many lifeboats were needed, you looked at the tonnage of the ship, and there was a formula for that. Design by formula is still something that, that plagues us today, and we hope that we train engineers to think beyond just the formula. There's common sense, after all. The, the other problems with the Titanic 
uh, were. Um, one, the radio, or as it was then called, wireless, uh, was a new technology. And it meant that ships could communicate not only ship to shore, but also ship to ship. But the Titanic and other ships at the time were thinking, well, after hours, maybe we'll shut down this novelty and uh, not monitor what a nearby ship might be sending, such as an SOS. Uh, another problem with the Titanic was that its uh, bulkheads that separated parts of the ship that were ostensibly designed to keep water that might leak into one compartment hold from passing over into others uh, was thought to be a sound design. Well, it proved not to be because the bulkheads only went so far up, and as the ship started uh, tilting down, the water could splash over the bulkheads. So the sinking of the Titanic, the failure of the Titanic, if you will, taught engineers, taught ship designers, a lot about how they could improve their designs. And by then, focusing on those points of failure in the next generation of ships, they could build safer, more successful ones. But let me ask you to suspend the reality for a moment and imagine that the Titanic had not struck the iceberg on her maiden voyage. Imagine that the Titanic did not sink. Now, that's a reasonable thought experiment, because as, as I've already pointed out, it was really just a chance encounter that might have been avoided in a variety of ways, such as paying attention. Uh, so if the Titanic had not sunk, let's say the Titanic went from uh, one side of the Atlantic to the other successfully, uh, what would have been the consequence? Everybody would have took, taken that as confirmation, validation that it was indeed an unsinkable ship. It would have gone back and forth who knows how many times, and with luck, never sunk. What would be the consequences of that for design, for the engineering of subsequent ships, not only of uh, the Titanic's uh, uh, company, but of competitors. What would competitors have wanted to do? Well, they would have liked to have designed ships that probably were faster, that probably held more people. The same kind of competition we see today among cruise ship companies. Uh, they would like to also to probably design those ships so that they would be less expensive to build. Uh, one way of doing that was to make the hulls lighter, thinner, uh, another way would be maybe to not worry about the bulkheads as much. Uh, they certainly wouldn't put more lifeboats on. After all, why does an uh, uh, unsinkable ship need any lifeboats at all? The tendency toward evolution would have been to make a less inherently successful uh, ship. And in fact, uh, I believe this would naturally have occurred had the failure not occurred. So, Failures, as much as we dislike them and hope they don't happen, especially to us, we have to take the lessons that they teach us seriously, not ignore them, not sweep them under the rug. We also, at the same time, have to be cautious about embracing success too readily. Just because something works one time doesn't mean it's going to work forever, because there could be latent flaws in the design, just like in the Titanic with its holds and so forth that I've pointed out. So I think that sets the scene for what I would like to concentrate on in, for a more extended period, and that's the uh, design of suspension bridges. Bridges have evolved the same way ships have evolved in the time since the Titanic and before. And let me talk about suspension bridges. Excuse me. Let me talk about suspension bridges starting in the early 1800s, the early part of the 19th century. Suspension bridges were modern in the sense that iron was being used in them. The chains that give a suspension bridge its characteristic profile were being made of iron in the early 19th century, and that was different from the traditional, uh, say, um, folk kind of suspension bridge that were that was built in so many uh, more primitive cultures where they would use natural materials such as vines and woven ropes and so forth. 
bridges that, that had to be replaced regularly because those materials naturally deteriorate. Something like iron was not thought at the time to be susceptible to that kind of thing. This is one of the most famous and one of the most admired suspension bridges of the time, the Menai Strait Suspension Bridge. The Menai Strait is in Wales, between the mainland of Wales and the Isle of Anglesey, which is in the north, off the northwest corner of the country. It's a very strategic strait, and uh, it was very important in the early 19th century for establishing an efficient connection between London and Dublin uh, to maintain the uh, kingdom and to be able to get troops and uh, other, other uh, important people like uh, parliamentarians back and forth in an efficient and safe way. So it was important to put roads through Wales so to get over to the Irish Sea and then take a ferry over. And it was uh, also uh, important then to build a bridge across the Menai Strait, one of the greatest challenges that engineers had faced up until that time. The road taking it, uh, taking the traffic through uh, Wales is today the A5, if you know the uh, road map of that part of the country. But unfortunately, bridges like this, to which so much was paid, attention was paid to their uh, chains, uh, had a problem, and that is they were susceptible to being destroyed in the wind. Uh, this is a bridge that uh, was built out into the English Channel at Brighton. Uh, technically, it's a suspension bridge. Uh, in practice, it was a uh, recreational pier, we would call it uh, today. Uh, this bridge was destroyed on more than one occasion, had to be rebuilt. The Menai Strait Suspension Bridge, even though it had substantial stone towers, well, I should say has, it still stands today, and these wrought iron chains to suspend its roadway, uh, its roadway was susceptible also to being destroyed in the wind because it was a light fabric compared to the stone towers and the iron chains. Uh, this is something that often happens in technology. You pay so much attention to what seems to be the new part of the technology that you forget how it's integrated with the more traditional part, such as the roadway. Well, there were two ways to respond for engineers to these repeated failures of suspension bridges. And believe me, there were many, many more than I've just suggested here. One is to say, OK, suspension bridges don't look like such good designs after all, especially if we want them to carry heavier loads than just carriages and spare or animal now and then. We want them to do something different in the 1830s and 40s, and that is carry railroad trains, a new technology. It turns out that because these bridges were so flexible, because their roadways were so flexible, if you drive a heavy locomotive over them, the locomotive causes the center span of the bridge to deflect so much that the train effectively has to crawl out of a valley of its own construction. So there were then arguments that we shouldn't use suspension bridges for railroads. We should look for an alternative. But the other way is to say, well, there are failures occurring with these bridges, true. But why don't we study those failures? Why don't we figure out what it is, what's common to all those failures, and integrate that knowledge into our new designs? And from failure come to success. Well, these two responses were effectively what the British versus the Americans uh, followed. The British looked for alternatives to suspension bridge designs, and the engineer that's most closely associated with that was Robert Stevenson. Robert Stevenson was very important to the development of the railroads. He and his father, George Stevenson, uh, were uh, the designers and builders of some of the early locomotives. Uh, Stevenson Robert was at one time responsible for about a third of the track mileage that was going through uh, Britain. Uh, and Stevenson was faced with the problem of building a bridge across the Menai Strait in Wales. And he and his father agreed that the existing suspension bridge, for all of its beauty, all of its aesthetic appeal, wasn't suitable for the trains. 
in particular the heavy locomotives. So Robert Stevens had took the challenge and said, I'm going to come up with a different design that will not uh, be touched by the wind effectively. So this Menai Strait, uh, the suspension bridge was rejected as a railroad, as a vehicle for railroads, and about a mile uh, away from the uh, suspension bridge, a new bridge was constructed. And this, was no, this became known as the Britannia Tubular Bridge. It's called the Britannia because there was a rock out in the middle of the uh, strait that was well known as an obstacle to shipping, and it was known as the Britannia Rock. So what Robert Stevenson said, well, if that's already an obstacle to shipping, nobody will mind if I build a tower on that rock and connect it to the land on each side by long girders or long tubes. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit. The uh, suspension bridge was chosen in the first place for the road because it provided a wide navigation channel, about five, over 500 feet between its towers. And it provided plenty of clearance. And that's the nature of a suspension bridge, is to do that. But here, Stevenson tried to uh, achieve that same objective with a totally different kind of bridge. He wanted to construct wrought iron tubes and that meant riveting together many, many uh, sheets of, of wrought iron. It's like you know, putting a lot of four by eight sheets of plywood together to make a 500 foot long tube that's about 30 feet high. In fact, the tube was so large structurally that his concept was we'll let the trains drive through it rather than ride on top of it. So here's the construction of that, that bridge. And these tubes were fabricated toward the, on the shore, by the shore, then they were floated into place and jacked up. By doing it this way, there was a minimum interruption of shipping, which had precedence, of course, and, uh, and the bridge was completed around 1850. A total structural success, we could say, because uh, the way these bridges were tested back then was you looked around the neighborhood and you got as many railroad locomotives as you could to uh, pile onto the bridge and see what would happen. Uh, in many cases, the, uh, the engineer who designed it would uh, either stand or sit in a rowboat underneath the bridge to show his confidence in his design. Well, in the case of this Britannia bridge, it showed no uh, movement under all that load. It, th that's how they, what they do is they monitor how much it's going to deflect from its normal position. So that's, that was called a proof test. It sort of proved that the design worked. And this, this then railroad uh, bridge uh, was, was hailed as a great success. This is a kind of project that was watched by people all around the, the world. But it had some problems. Um, it's, it's hard to find a totally perfect design when you look at it in the big context of everything. And one of the everythings in this case was, well, how do people experience this bridge as they drive through it? After all, it's somewhat of a tunnel in the sky. And what that meant uh, was, the implications of that uh, were that, well, when the sun was shining down, it got very hot inside that tunnel. And also, remember, the trains of that time uh, spewed out sparks and smoke and soot. So it was a very uh, dirty experience to ride a train through such a confining environment. In fact, we could call it, in today's terms, an environmental failure. But people had to tolerate it if they wanted to get across the Menai Strait in a train. Another way in which it was a failure, if we could say that, was that it cost too much. It was a very, very expensive proposition. And uh, as a result, very, very few other bridges of this kind were built. There was one in Canada near Montreal. I think there were a couple in Egypt but maybe a handful or a few more uh, around the world, and it became an obsolete design very, very quickly. There were other ways to achieve the same objectives that the Britannia Bridge did, and those objectives are, again, basically to clear about a 500-foot span to allow a wide channel, and also to have a high clearance uniformly over that 500-foot uh, span. This is one example. This was out in southwest England near Plymouth. Uh, this was designed by another engineer, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, uh, 
the uh, British adore Brunel, or most British do. And this shows that, one of the things this shows is that for a given engineering problem, maybe span 500 feet with a good clearance, uh, there's not a single solution. We've already seen three now with this. We saw suspension bridges, we saw the Britannia tubular bridge, and now this, this hybrid arch suspension bridge is what this really is. And I won't elaborate on its technical details, but what we can see just by looking at the picture is that it's an open design. It's not trapping all that soot and hot air in there. Uh, so this showed that there was a better way uh, to, uh, to do it. So this was the British tradition, uh, pretty much. In the background is a suspension bridge, but that wasn't built until modern motor, uh, you know, motorway, uh, the, the modern motorway era in, in Britain. The, Brit the Brits had generally uh, rejected the suspension bridge as an alternative because of their bad experience with the failures of the early 19th century. But what happened in America? Well, in America, there was a different engineer who really led the pack, and his name was John Roebling. Roebling was born in Germany. He emigrated to the United States in the 1830s. Uh, he had studied bridge building in Germany, among other things. He came to this country because uh, he wanted to try a different life. He wanted to really try an agrarian life in which there would be farming would be the principal focus. He found it was hard to make a go of that, and he began to get back into more technical fields such as making wire rope and later using that wire rope in uh, bridge applications. What Roebling did, rather than say, oh, suspension bridges just don't work, they get their decks get destroyed in the wind, he said, what can I learn from all those failures? And what he basically did, what we would say, to say today of research is he surveyed the literature. And all of these bridge failures had been written about in the popular press and the technical press. It was a, it was a puzzle uh, to be solved, what was happening. And basically, Roebling solved it in a sufficient degree of detail to go on to build successful bridges. He concluded that storms are unquestionably the greatest enemies of suspension bridges. It doesn't seem like a very profound uh, statement, but it's what the statement leads an engineer or a designer to do in response to this simple observation. This is the bridge that Roebling designed and completed in the mid-1850s. And uh, it's a suspension bridge, as you can see. It has a railroad train traveling across its top deck, at least. And uh, the, there's no deflection of the bridge. So what the Stevenson, what Stevenson was worried about is not demonstrated here. Roebling had somehow succeeded in designing a bridge that would carry a railroad train without significant deflection of the roadway and also that would be able to stand up, withstand the winds. This bridge happened to go across the Niagara Gorge between New York State and Canada. In the background, you can actually make out Niagara Falls if you uh, look, look closely. The, uh, uh, the bridge uh, was, was really a landmark in solving the problem of suspension bridges. Roebling was asked, what made your bridge work when everybody else thought you couldn't do this kind of thing? Well, he said, weight, girders, trusses, and stays. Just to simplify this in non-technical terms, weight is pretty self-evident. He, he said the bridge had to be heavy. He achieved his bridge giving it heaviness, weight, by having that double deck, as you saw in the picture. He joined them together, and they were joined together with a lot more substantial timbers than shown in that, uh, that etching. And that gave the bridge a lot of mass, a lot of weight. The massiveness of the bridge meant that it had a lot of inertia, and that meant gusts of wind couldn't move it easily. So that was one thing he integrated into his designs. The Menai Strait Suspension Bridge, on the other hand, was, had a very light deck. Girders and trusses, basically, uh, in uh, less technical terms, means giving it stiffness. And by joining the top and the lower deck, Roebling made a very stiff structure. You, it didn't bend easily. So the wind couldn't get it moving very easily at all. The stays were cables 
that got the bridge to literally stay in place. Uh, Roebling recognized that the wind burst from below could move the, the light bridge deck up, burst from above could drive it down. So he put these diagonal cables every which way he could think of to keep that from happening. In other words, his designs were all incorporating features that prevented something from happening. Engineers in situations like this have to think in the negative. What don't I want to happen? And the ultimate thing you don't want to happen is failure. So everything's in service to trying to prevent a failure of one kind or another. So these were the two approaches, the British versus the American. These are just two different views of the, uh, the bridges of Stevenson and, and Roebling. Ro Stevenson uh, wrote to Roebling. Remember, I said earlier that everybody around the world watched great construction projects, and literally they, they did. They would visit the sites if they could. If they couldn't, they would write letters. And the postal service was remarkably reliable uh, at, at that time. If your, <laughs> if your bridge succeeds, uh, Stevenson wrote to Roebling, mine is a magnificent blunder. And basically what he was talking about was economics. Roebling had figured out how to build a bridge that could sustain the weight of a railroad train of the time without significant deflection or movement, nor would it move significantly in the wind. And that was, after all, that was Stevenson's main objective. He just overkilled the problem. So these, again, are the two solutions. Now, let me talk about how uh, Roebling went on to build other su successful bridges and, uh, and then show how these successful bridges led to failures and uh, almost come full circle. One of um, uh, John Roebling's uh, designs was the Cincinnati bridge across the Ohio River at Cincinnati, which many of you may be familiar with. It still stands. It's been modified. Uh, but it basically, it had the components that Roebling said. It had weight, it had a wide roadway, it had stiffness, the trusses, and it had the stays, the diagonal cables. His masterpiece, the Brooklyn Bridge, he designed, conceptually at least, and uh, of course, many of you probably know the story that he died before this bridge could really get, the construction of this bridge could really get underway, and it was his son and uh, daughter-in-law that, that actually saw through the construction of the, the bridge. This is a modern photograph, or a more recent photograph, of the, uh, of the bridge. And uh, again, you can see how the roadway is wide. Uh, that gives it the mass. The truss, you can see, this truss was, is actually relocated from the original design, but nevertheless, it still uh, is providing the stiffness. That was part of his formula. And uh, you see the diagonal stays. In fact, the diagonal stays, called stay cables, uh, are characteristic of the Brooklyn Bridge and of, of most of Roebling's large suspension bridge designs. Uh, this is the walkway of the Brooklyn Bridge. It's elevated above the traffic, so it's a very wonderful experience to walk across the Brooklyn Bridge. I consider it one of the grand pedestrian experiences in the world, in, in fact. Uh, and it was largely because of an engineer's thoughtful design. Putting the roadway, putting the wa walkway, the pedestrian walkway above the roadway made it a quieter experience, meant that when you looked from le to left or right, you didn't see cars whizzing by, you saw the river. Uh, if you, to this day, you can walk across this bridge and you can look out into New York Harbor and see the Statue of Liberty, for example. So this is the Brooklyn Bridge. And this was the state of bridge building in the 1880s, suspension bridge building, let me emphasize. Now, what happened subsequent to this? We can, excuse me, we can say that Roebling set out a paradigm of success. His bridges were unqualified successes. But then what happened? What did other engineers do with that paradigm? Well, they followed it. The first major suspension bridge to be designed and constructed after the Brooklyn Bridge was the Williamsburg Bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge, in fact, made such a contribution to the infrastructure of what were then the separate cities of New York and Brooklyn that 
the existence of the very existence of the bridge contributed to the consolidation of those two formerly separate cities into part of what today is known as Greater New York City. And the, the development, especially of Brooklyn, was so rapid that soon there was a need for a second bridge. And uh, soon there was need for a third, and so forth. But I want to stop here and look at this bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge. At one time, this was the longest suspension bridge in the world, 1,600 feet between the towers. It, it's only about five feet more than the Brooklyn Bridge, but nevertheless, it's, it's more. Uh, is it as attractive as the Brooklyn Bridge? The Brooklyn Bridge is an iconic structure. Uh, its stone towers with the, their twin Gothic uh, arches are, are really something that actually architects have tried to take credit for over time, or some people have uh, given them credit for. Uh, this bridge, on the other hand, is not an aesthetic model, in my opinion. In my opinion, it's not a very attractive structure. Uh, it's not well proportioned. It doesn't have very much grace at all. But it was an all-steel bridge. It didn't take as long to build. It didn't have to lay every stone separately to build up the towers. Uh, large pieces of steel could be, can be employed. Very utilitarian towers. They're there not to make an aesthetic statement, but to hold up the suspension cables. After all, a suspension bridge you can think of as sort of a clothesline, and you need to hold it up at certain points. And the uh, roadway you can see in this case is encased by a very prominent truss. That's what a truss is, if I didn't explain that. You see all these triangles connected together. That's truss work in, in engineering, and you call the collective thing a truss. Now, it was made very big like this because this bridge was to carry railroad, in particular subway trains across the river. The trains come up out of the ground and then go across the river and then go back into the, into the ground. But the most significant thing I want to point out here is that we're starting the evolutionary trend from success to failure. Roebling's formula was for success was needed weight. Well, this certainly has weight. It screams weight. You need stiffness, and that very same truss provides the stiffness, but it doesn't have the stays. This bridge doesn't have any of the diagonal cables that Roebling said were so important to keep the bridge from moving in the wind. Well, because this bridge was so heavy, it had so much inertia, truly you didn't need them. It was like a belt and suspenders principle. But that started the trend. Every, suspension, every major suspension bridge built in the early 20th century did not have the stays that Roebling deemed essential. This is the next bridge that was built on the East River in New York between Manhattan and Brooklyn. Uh, this is the Manhattan Bridge. It's between the Brooklyn and the Williamsburg, so you have these three significant structures right next to each other. Uh, here you can see there was an attempt to use steel, this is also an all-steel bridge, in an aesthetic way. There was a consulting architect on, on this bridge, and you can see the steel is somewhat sculpted rather than just assembled like pieces of an erector set. This was also about 1,600 feet between towers. So these are all major, major structures. And they continued to be built around the country. This is the Benjamin Franklin Bridge across the Delaware River at Philadelphia, connecting it to Camden, uh, New Jersey about 1,700 feet between towers. And typically, this is the way things go with engineering of large structures, incremental and lengthening, increasing in height, whatever is, is the appropriate measure. But then in 1931, a different kind of change was introduced. Uh, whereas all these previous structures had trusses, no stay cables, but trusses, this bridge, the George Washington Bridge, across the Hudson River in New York, was built without a truss. The Hudson River is on the west side of Manhattan. It's about twice as wide as the East River, over which the Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Williamsburg bridges span. So it was a, really a leap to span that great distance. And this bridge just about doubled the span length of all suspension bridges in existence at the time. So it was quite a feat. And remembering Roebling's formula again, OK, it has weight. It has weight simply because it's a very, very wide bridge. Uh, it was designed 
to later accommodate a lower roadway. And if you're familiar with the George Washington, you say, yeah, this doesn't look like it because that lower roadway wasn't added until 1964. But the cables had to be made to, to be able to sustain that uh, when it was added. So the cables themselves are very heavy. So it's a heavy bridge. It has weight. It has mass. And uh, it was stiff me by the mere fact that there was so much weight hanging from it, it was hard for the wind to do anything to change its shape. But what the George Washington Bridge contributed to the design climate, if I can call it that, was that it introduced a new aesthetic within engineering, within bridge building, at least, bridge design. And that was that you should try to make your bridge look as slender as possible, at least its deck. You have to have the towers. You have to have the cables. There's not much you can do with those. But the deck, you can make as slender as possible. And you get something that looks like a ribbon of steel being suspended over 3,500 feet is the span of this, this bridge. So subsequent suspension bridge designers wanted to emulate this. Uh, they had clearly departed from Roebling's formula. And they were on their way to departing even further. The Golden Gate Bridge was built, designed and built in the 30s. And this is the uh, Golden Gate as it was completed in 1937. Uh, the designer of the George Washington Bridge, his name is Othmar Allman. Uh, he was on a, one of the consulting engineers for the Golden Gate, Gate Bridge. The Golden Gate Bridge is about 20% longer in span than the George Washington, 4,200 feet. It may not look like it from here, but it's also a very slender structure. Uh, the truss is there because its design sort of started before the George Washington was completed and set that new aesthetic. The Golden Gate Bridge, completed in 1937, was a signal that something was happening. Shortly after the Golden Gate Bridge opened, it was clear that its roadway, its deck, as it's called in engineering terms, was very flexible. And uh, if you stood at one tower and sighted down to the other tower, for example, and the wind was blowing very strong, you would see the roadway curve out as much as 14 feet it was reported. Uh, so the wind could change its shape, maybe, you know, sort of like a, a locomotive changing its shape vertically, the wind could change its shape horizontally. Another problem with the Golden Gate they noticed after a while was when the wind blew in a certain way with a certain force, the roadway would sort of ripple, this steel structure. Well, they decided that uh, they wanted to stiffen it eventually, and uh, they added more steel, uh, making a, basically a stiffer truss to support the roadway. And just to make a long story short, because I want to get on to more important things, to this day, the Golden Gate Bridge uh, cannot tolerate any more traffic than uses it because of all this added steel that was put in at the time. People would love to have a lower roadway on the Golden Gate or take a train, uh, put a train on it, but it just can't be done. But then something happened later in the 1930s. Bridges began to be completed that were designed in the wake of the George Washington and designed to this new aesthetic, therefore. But what was different was these bridges were not in major cities like New York and San Francisco or Philadelphia. They were in remote areas, generally speaking. And one of those remote areas was upstate New York, where the St. Lawrence separates it from Canada in the Thousand Islands region. So because there was little traffic demand up there, this was a narrow bridge. So it was a long bridge, a narrow bridge, had no significant truss, no significant stiffness. It began to, when the wind was uh, blowing in a certain way, the roadway revealed its flexibility. What was happening? Engineers weren't quite sure. They weren't totally sure, because they were designing in this successful climate. They were following successful paradigms. And uh, it was not clear if it wasn't happening to these other bridges, why was it happening to theirs? Another bridge that was built in the same period was the Deer Isle Bridge. Deer Isle is an isle off the uh, mainland of Maine. Uh, obviously, a lot of sailing. Uh, so that called for a bridge with a large span and a high clearance, just like at the Menai Strait. Uh, there's a lot of 
benefit to knowing history because the same problems keep repeating and the same, not only problems to solve, but problems with the solution. Here's that bridge, two lanes, very narrow, virtually no sidewalk. So it's a very narrow, very long, very shallow structure. Think of a yardstick compared to a two by four, let's say. The two by four is a very stiff structure. The yardstick's a very flexible structure. This was a very flexible roadway, and it also began to show that. This is a later picture of the bridge, and you see all these crossed cables. Well, those were not part of the original design. Remember, aesthetics was driving these designs to a very large extent. So the idea was to have as clean a uh, pattern of supports as possible. These were all added after this was all the, there was all this motion of the roadway. Another bridge in 1939 was this uh, Bronx Whitestone Bridge. This was also designed by Othmar Amon. This is, was built for the 1939 World's Fair in Queens, New York. And uh, Amon was just following his own aesthetic. Uh, long and uh, shallow uh, bridge, you can see here. It also began to undulate in the wind. And I'll just make you know, a long story short. This was how it was later fixed, fixed up, if you want to call it that. Uh, the truss was added hastily, it, so the aesthetic suddenly became unimportant. Uh, I, I used to use this bridge a lot when I was going to school in New York, and uh, I cursed that truss every time I went over the bridge because it blocked a beautiful view of the New York City skyline. But uh, today that's removed, and other people appreciated uh, that the view was important, and they have other ways of fixing this now. But then this all culminates with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, which I'm sure not a lot of you know about, but I'll just repeat just briefly. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was designed in the same design climate, if you will. Um, aesthetics was important, uh, and uh, making it uh, look as slender as possible between the towers was a goal, an explicit goal. The Tacoma Narrows was uh, Tacoma, Washington at the time, and you know, SeaTac Airport, Seco Seattle, Tacoma, it's uh, south of Seattle. The Narrows is the narrowest part of Puget Sound in that uh, region, uh, hence the Tacoma Narrows. The bridge was to span about 2,800 feet over the Narrows. That made it the third longest suspen suspension span in the world, behind the Golden Gate, the George Washington, and then, then this. Uh, but unlike the Golden Gate and the George Washington, it was very, this is a very narrow, two lanes. Again, virtually no sidewalk and also a very shallow deck. Well, needless to say, this exhibited the same flexibility as these other late 30s bridges. And uh, it was very important to try to understand this. But people actually were beginning to get used to these flexible bridges. Engineers didn't panic. They, they were studying it, but they didn't think any of these bridges would be in danger, real danger of collapse. Uh, people began to ride over these bridges and create more traffic on them than anticipated uh, because they were great fun. <laughs> Here's the opening day of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. But this is what happened four months after the bridge opened. Uh, when the bridge began to undulate vertically, uh, some extra cables were added, some of these diagonal cables, like I indicated at the uh, Deer Isle Bridge. But it's believed that what happened is in this day in November, at least one of those cables became dislodged, and uh, that ruined the symmetry of the bridge. So one side was supported differently than the other, and that enabled the bridge to start twisting. It was already flexible, so all it needed was you know, the allowance to move. Well, it twisted and twisted and eventually uh, collapsed. So it keeps twisting. The concrete starts breaking up. That makes it less stiff and eventually it collapses completely. Well, of course, you want to know what happened, so there's a committee appointed, and they report lessons learned in 18, 1941. <laughs> Wind is the enemy of suspension bridges. <laughs> <Duh. laughs> Flexible decks are vulnerable to the wind. Well, this is what John Roebling basically said exactly 100 years earlier. Remember, his survey of failures, he came to basically these conclusions. And his solution was, of course, to uh, resist the wind. But 
uh, the lessons had not been learned. And this is because, as I hope I've made clear, and the, the reason for you know, doing this at length is to make it more than just a statement of mine, but to back it up with this historical evidence, that there was a, there was a following of a successful paradigm that degenerated into this, this failure. So, whereas Roebling had said weight stiffness and stays, people forgot first the stays, and that was okay because it was sort of belt and suspenders, but then they forgot the weight, and then, excuse me, then the stiffness by taking away the truss, and then the weight by making very narrow structures. So my pitch is, at this point, that the value of history, not only as a cultural adjunct to engineering, or bridge building, or any field, really, but really as an integral part of it. There, there's a lot of value to the history of, I'll stick with engineering, uh, that doesn't become obsolete just because we have better tools of analysis. The key to successful design is really understanding what can go wrong, what can fail, and how you design against that. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was rebuilt, just to close the story, and uh, it was rebuilt with what? A prominent truss. So aesthetics is no longer driving the design, obviously. Uh, not only uh, to uh, show people that it's a stiffer structure, uh, but also to show that the old model is not being followed. Today, there's a second Tacoma Narrows Bridge that was just recently completed, again, because the bridge increases the capacity of the infrastructure, and therefore you need a new bridge, and it seems like a never-ending cycle. There's a famous quotation with which I'll end. Progress, far from consisting in change, depends on retentiveness. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I think the story of suspension bridges illustrates that, and I think it's an example of how important it is to understand failure, not just as an anomaly, but as really the secret to success. Thank you very much. Professor Petrosky has kindly agreed to answer a few questions from some of the audience members. So if any of you have any questions, we'd be happy to entertain some. There are two microphones, one here in the fourth row and one on the left aisle as well. So. Please go ahead. Uh, would you care to say anything about the Pont de Normandie in France, which is a very aesthetic and beautiful bridge, and I've walked across it in both directions. I have too. <laughs> the, the, uh, the Pont de Normandie is at the mouth of the Seine, and it, it's really a very graceful uh, looking structure. Uh, remember, Roebling said you needed stays. Well, some people began to say, and as I sort of alluded to several times, that those stays are sort of like a belt and suspenders principle. Do you need the suspension cables as well as the stay cables? And some have argued that no, you can get rid of the suspension cables and just have stay cables, and these are called cable stayed bridges. And they've become very popular uh, in the last 50 years or so. And the Pont de Normandie is an example of that. Now, in stay cable bridges, you ha still have two towers, but the cables go directly from the tower to the roadway, and they usually are arranged in parallel lines or radiating lines. Some people say they're suggestive of, of, of the strings of a harp. Well, the Pont de Normandie uh, is almost about, it's around 2,800 feet between the towers. So just coincidentally, it's similar to the, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in scale. When cable stay bridges were first introduced, it was thought that they should never be that long. They should be no longer than less than half that, that distance. Well, when the Pont de Normandie uh, opened, it was noticed that its cables were swaying in the wind, were vibrating in the wind. Great distances, notable distances. Uh, and this was not expected, one. And it's alarming, too. Uh, alarming to people going across the bridge. You've got to pay a quite hefty toll to drive across this bridge. Uh, people didn't, didn't like that idea. Uh, the center of the bridge also moved up and down considerably. So uh, what was done was that the cables, the stay cables, 
were tied together with other cables that cut across them. It actually ruined the aesthetic appeal of the bridge. But the reason that was done is, as you know, and it's appropriate here in this, this hall, just as the piano strings have different to tones, because they have different frequencies, different lengths, partly, uh, if you tie two adjacent strings together, they're going to damp out each other because they don't vibrate at the same frequency. So if one gets going, the other one wants to resist it. Uh, also, at the center of the bridge, they installed um, tr basically truck shock absorbers, very heavy-duty shock absorbers to check that motion. Well, to make a long story short, this bridge has exhibited unanticipated behavior. It's similar to what was happening to suspension bridges back in the 1930s. Now, the Pont de Normandy is just one example. Many, many of these cable stay bridges that have opened in the last decade or so, let's say, have exhibited similar problems. So what's happening? Well, engineers aren't totally sure because it's a complicated phenomenon. Uh, the last bridge conference I went to on cable stay bridges was just a few years ago, and one of the uh, major designers around the world uh, admitted that they really don't know how to design a cable stay bridge to guarantee 100% that this cable motion will not happen. So we're in a situation similar to what was happening to suspension bridges before the Tacoma Narrows collapsed. And I've speculated on occasion that, well, maybe we should be watching cable stay bridges a little more closely as we design longer and longer ones. Thank you, Henry. One more? Uh, my question is not specifically about bridges, but engineering. Uh, personally and professionally, I'm frustrated about the status, the low status that I perceive engineers to have socially and politically in the United States. Um, I hear everybody groaning. Uh, could you give us some encouragement, hopefully? <laughs> well, I think being aware of, of a profession's history is uh, very important. And um, you know, I've gone through this litany of success and failure, but the early part of my talk, I tried to indicate some of the really great achievements of, of engineering uh, to the infrastructure, to civilization. Uh, for example, in this country in the early part of the 20th century, the water supply was really very problematic in uh, creating a lot of diseases that were not fully understood either. It's not only engineers that don't understand things at a given time in history. Uh, the, the medical doctors at the time weren't quite sure uh, what, was, what was happening. In the construction of the Panama Canal, there was great mystery about what was causing uh, problems tr with tropical diseases. Uh, it was the engineering community with contributions like the Victoria Embankment in London that really helped the sanitation of the country, this country and subsequently other uh, countries, including, of course, Britain. Uh, and they were actually called sanitary engineers at the time. Uh, they understood that because biologists were beginning to understand that there were microbes that were causing a lot of the problems, that you could filter those out. You had to filter water. Uh, you had to take, separate sewage from clean water and so forth. There, there are great contributions to, uh, to civilization, to society, to, uh, I, I talked about how the Brooklyn Bridge helped unite Brooklyn and uh, the separate city of New York at, at the time. There, there's plenty uh, to brag about, if, if you will, but engineers have to learn how to articulate this. They have to be able to uh, go head to head with architects, for example, who, who uh, uh, get credit. There's a wonderful new bridge in France. It's also a cable stay bridge. It goes across this deep valley, the Tarn Valley. And it's just a spectacular structure because it's so high above the valley floor. Uh, it was designed by an engineer and an architect working as a team. Uh, the engineer happens to be uh, Michel Villageau, who actually designed the uh, Pont de Normandy also, just coincidentally. But the architect involved was Norman Foster, who is just much more widely known than the engineer. Engineers have to try to position themselves uh, in such a way that they're more widely known, not only for their accomplishments, but also as individuals. Civil Engineering Magazine, the magazine of uh, my society, my principal society, has actually uh, consciously made a change in their editorial policy 
and that is to put people on the cover of their monthly magazine rather than just the bridges or the buildings that those people design. So there's a, there's a conscious effort uh, being, uh, uh, being made to uh, personalize the engineer, if you will, and I think that will go a long way. Uh, read, read the history of your profession. There, uh, there's so much to be proud of, of what engineers have, have contributed to uh, society and culture. And I think it's very important uh, right now, uh, given the political situation in, in Washington, for engineers to be recognized, because there's a lot of what at least I hear coming out of Washington that we've got to fund science. Science is very important because it's science that gives us innovation. That was something that was basically uh, dismissed about 50 years ago. It's not science that leads to innovation, it's engineering that leads to innovation. Sometimes science is essential as a starting point, but there have been a lot of accomplishments made by engineers and inventors that had no participation by scientists. You think of the Wright brothers, for example. They wanted to design a, an airplane that would be powered by an engine. They couldn't find any science to tell them how to do that. I mentioned in my talk, I believe, that the design of the steam engine had to proceed without, without science. Uh, today, it's, it, it, it's got to be appreciated by policymakers, by, by uh, people in uh, control of the budgets in particular, that if they're going to try to bypass engineering, uh, they're going to introduce an extra hurdle for themselves. Well, thank you for your question. I hope I've responded to it. Right, you know it and I know it. I'm, I'm worried about the rest of the country. Well, maybe there are a few non-engineers in here that heard it now. Thank you. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> we have time for one more question. This is the last question for tonight. I'm one of the non-engineers. Um, well, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. There are a lot of engineers in my family of various ilks, um, but I'm not one of them at all. Um, the, uh, thank you for mentioning the Deer Isle Bridge as it goes over beautiful Egamug and Reach. Um, I've been over it a, probably a thousand times, but not for a few years. Um, the last, um, there are a couple of questions about it. Um, it's the last time that I was over it, which were, was about um, 10 years ago or something like that, it still sways. Yes. And, um, so the one question is, when was the stabilizing uh, approach to it put in? Two, does it, fit, does it in the future face the same um, unhappy end that the Tacoma Narrows uh, Bridge does? And if uh, so, or if not, um, is, it, um, is it advisable to replace it with something, and if so, what? Well, those are three uh, good questions, or I'll just summarize them as, as three. Uh, the correcting, correcting um, features uh, were added very early after the Tacoma Narrows Bridge collapsed, but they've evolved, and, and more recently there have been some changes in that. I do know the bridge, that bridge has been closed on occasion because of the winds moving it uh, too, too much. Uh, will it be uh, replaced? I think that's, uh, that's, a, that's more of a political question than an engineering question. Uh, the bridge obviously is standing, and as we've seen, you know, successful structures are going to continue to be successful. Huh? <laughs> so uh, I doubt that that bridge is going to be slated for uh, replacement uh, soon. There are a lot of other bridges in Maine that uh, are in worse shape than, than that bridge. One was the bridge across the Penobscot River, uh, that uh, the Waldo Hancock Bridge, if you know the, the area. Uh, the house at half a mile from there. Uh -huh. well, well, you know that that was recently replaced. Uh, that was an expensive proposition. And the reason that was replaced was because it was corroding to such an extent that it was in danger of really literally dropping. I don't think the, uh, well, the, the Deer Isle Bridge, or as you refer to it as the Ergamongan Reach Bridge, uh, is in immediate danger of collapse. But then I could be just saying what the Tacoma Narrows engineer said in, in 1940. I, 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 I think it's demonstrated its, uh, its robustness Good. by now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.